Okay, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, finding a role in science communication and the fact that everybody finds their own role and that we're not all kind of identikit uh, communicators. Um, and I'll discuss a few of the things that I think we do well, a few of the things that I think uh, we do badly um, as we go along. Um, so, with no further ado. So, as you know, we are dealing with a situation where we have a somewhat politicized uh, discourse, um, where people use science uh, and politics kind of interchangeably, and that does not uh, bode well for clear communication. And so we get a lot of, uh, we get a lot of nonsense. Uh, we get a lot of um, straw man arguments and gish gallops and uh, claptrap and, and red herrings and sensationalism and all the right. So, what do you do to try and fix that? First thing you do is I think you have to think about why it is you want to communicate with anybody, right? And, and, and oftentimes people kind of have this desire to communicate and they want to tell people things, but they don't often, they're, not, they're sometimes not quite as reflective as they need to be uh, about why they're doing it. So why, why are you communicating? And there's lots of different reasons why you could communicate, right? It's not all the same reason. Okay, first of all, it could be uh, uh, film criticism. Uh, uh, you know, so that's it's not a political thing, it's just a really, really bad movie. Um, it might be political, like you might really find yourself opposed to the values and, uh, and standards that the Wall Street Journal uh, holds dear. Uh, literary criticism, uh, really people need to be protected from this kind of really, really bad literature. There's just not enough time in the world to read books as bad as State of Fear. <laughs> And given I, I, I forced myself to buy it, I forced myself to buy it on the first day that it came out, and I just spent the whole weekend just like kind of tearing my hair out, going, ah! And like making like this little forest of little post it notes. Yeah. So, ha ha! Hecklers as well. That's, uh, anyway. What are you going to communicate, right? Now, we have different skills, we have different knowledge bases, we have different you know, intuitions, right? We can't do it all, right? So be, we, you need to be strategic about what it is that you're going to talk about. If you're going to talk about communication, then be an expert on communication. If you're going to talk about science, be an expert on science. If you're going to talk about policy solutions, know something about policy solutions, right? Where are you going to do this? You could do it in, like, local high schools, a very good use of your time. You could do it at church groups. You can do it in town halls. You can do it on the Internet. You can do it on Twitter. You can do it on a blog. Think about where it is that, in a, in a sense, that makes it fit with why you're doing it and what it is that you're actually talking about. And then how do you do it? Right? That's, that's the trickiest thing because there are as many different ways to communicate as there are people. And, uh, you know, the way that, that we picked um, was uh, initially via, via the blog, Real Climate. Um, and uh, that's, that's worked out okay for us, but it isn't necessarily for everybody, right? So, there are some ethics that go along with communicating. Um, and particularly for the scientists in the room, I think we have particular responsibilities, right? We have a responsibility uh, to report what we do to the people who pay for it, right? Very few of us are independently wealthy and just pursuing science for the sake of our own uh, natural curiosity. We're doing it because we're paid to do it by governments and funding agencies and universities. So therefore, we have, a, we have a responsibility, we have an accountability to the people that pay for us. I think we also have a responsibility to avoid misuse of our work. Right? If people are saying that what we have concluded means X, Y, and Z, and we don't think that that's actually what we concluded, we have a, a responsibility to say that. We also have a responsibility to avoid sensationalism. When people uh, exaggerate what it is that you've discovered or what it is that you've talked about, uh, I think you, as the generator of that information, have a responsibility to tell people, no, 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 that's, that you're going too far, and what we've concluded is this and not that. Um, when people use your stuff for advocacy, and I'll get to what I mean by advocacy in a minute, uh, I think, again, you have uh, a responsibility to stand up and say, hey, you know, that's, that's not what we said, this isn't appropriate, you're making a link that isn't there, if that is the case. So how much effort do you have to put 
into promoting better understanding. Okay, now, like, you know, you do one little bit of scientific research, you could spend the whole of your life just trying to push it out and making, people sure, making sure that people understand it. So there's obviously a limit to how much effort you can put in. But there are a lot of very easy things that you can do uh, that, that go a long, long way to, uh, to improving understanding of what it is that you've done, right? So, you know, we do press releases, we do interviews, that's kind of standard. Um, we do briefings, right? We do uh, briefings for the policymakers, we do briefings for journalists and lay public and things. All of those things are good use of your time. And if you write that up, then you don't have to repeat it like 20 times, right? Write it up as a blog post, write it up as a f FAQ. Um, do an interactive Q&A. All of those things are excellent uses of your time. Now, you know, we, we mentioned that there are, that there, there's a politicized element to the discourse on climate science. Um, and a lot of that revolves around fake debates, fake issues that aren't issues in the science, but are the perceived issue among a certain group of people. And the temptation is to ignore things that aren't relevant to what you understand, or, or, or they'll drag up issues that uh, over and over and again just kind of re retread the same uh, very boring ground. You can ignore that, or you can use that to kind of point people in the direction of where actual interesting science is going on. Um, and, that, and it's not always easy to do, but I think if you try and do it, it's a very helpful thing to do. So I mentioned uh, the word advocacy before. It's very scary, advocacy. Ooh, mustn't be an advocate. Okay, so I, I think that that's bogus. Anybody who gets up in public and says something or who wants to communicate with anybody, you're advocating for something, right? Otherwise, why would you get out of bed in the morning, right? What is it, what is it you're doing? Why are you doing it, right? You're doing it for a reason. You're advocating for something. Now, what you need to be, though, is clear about what you are advocating for, right? Advocacy itself is not a dirty word, right? It's not a terrible thing to be doing. But you do need to be clear and upfront about what it is you're advocating for. And it could be very varied, right? You could just be advocating for clarity, right? That's a good thing to be advocating for. Everything is very, very confused in a lot of people's mind. Clarity is a good thing to be advocating for, in my opinion. Greater public understanding. I think, again, that is a, a universally accepted uh, positive value. So if that's what you're advocating for, then say it. That's a really good thing. Greater awareness of a particular problem. Again, if that's what you want people to know about, then be clear that that's what you want people to do. Now, you could also be advocating for a change in behavior. You know, you want people to do something differently. Okay, be clear about the fact that that's what you're doing. But it isn't given that just because you want to improve public understanding that you therefore are necessarily pushing for somebody to do something uh, extra. Now, there's often a perception that these things are linked, right? And if you don't talk about what it is you're advocating for, then those things will be linked, right? So by being clear in your advocacy, you can avoid, hopefully, uh, some of the, uh, the logical leaps that lead to let us say, uh, less desirable public discourse. Okay, so the same thing is going on. You know, you could just be here to entertain, right? I sometimes think of myself a little bit like that, um, but I'm not very good at it, so I go back to, you know, advocating for greater public understanding and clarity instead. <laughs> oh, one of the things that I think is very important that we neglect sometimes, and, I, and I'll also come back to this a little bit later, is the layering of information. Yeah. Um, not everybody needs or wants the same level of information, right? So, like a ski hill, you know, some people want to go down the easy slope, some people want to go down the, uh, the really extreme, uh, most difficult things. People want information in the same way, too. Um, and, uh, and I suggested this uh, a few years ago, and nobody took me up on it except for John Cook, who is sitting somewhere, he's there. And, and I really have to publicly apologize to him uh, for suggesting this, because apparently it's made his life a living hell. So uh, I apologize. Uh, but apparently there have been some upsides to it, which I'm sure he can go into. Um, it's important that we do that. So, really? Like five minutes? That would, geez. <laughs> um, 
Okay, boof. Uh, how, how do you cope in this, in this field? You know, don't make things worse, right? There's a lot of uh, times where people score kind of own goals because they take things personally, they get angry, they get upset. Um, they let PR people write their press release for them. Don't, don't let them do that. <laughs> um, make sure that anything that goes out with your name on it, you have vetted to the last comma. Um, understand where you're going into. A lot of people put stuff out there without understanding what the, what the background conversation is. And if you don't understand what the background conversation is, what the public discourse is, however divorced it is from real science, uh, you're just going to cause yourself all sorts of problems. Make sure you tell people what you can't conclude from your data, not just what you can. Because if you don't tell them what you can't, then people will just imagine it. Um, be careful with the whole popular opinions versus what everybody thinks thing. Uh, it's, it's important that you point these things out. Okay, um, I'm just going to skip a lot of this. So, obviously, just the facts does not work. So what do you do? You tell stories, right? Um, you tell stories about process. You tell stories about people. Uh, you use art. This is a photograph we used in, uh, in one of my books. Well, my only book, in fact. <laughs> one of my books. <laughs> one of my, well, I've got quite a lot of them on the table, right? <laughs> They're all the same, but, you know. Um, you know, tell stories, have people, and, that is it. and that you can get into, you know, what is this person doing? Why are they doing it? How difficult is this? It's, that's, those are important things. This is uh, Kim Cobb, some of you might know her, who has a much better job than we do. Uh, this is uh, off uh, a, a coral atoll in the middle of the Pacific. Graphs are terrible. I know, I know. I'm terrible. I take too much time. Pictures, much better, right? The, uh, uh, the glacier in Alaska somewhere, with the Mendenhall Glacier. Uh, 19th century, 20th century, 21st century. Big difference. People respond much more to images and changes in image and history through imagery than they do to graphs. So we have lots of things that are very hard to explain. Um, the nature of science, what scientists know, the provisional nature of proof. I'm clicking through here. What a model is. This is a climate model. Uh, it's an old climate model, right? Uh, <laughs> thankfully, the, uh, the GIST model is not quite that uh, antiquated anymore. Uh, here's an old climate modeler. We, we do still have some of those. Um, we, we make things worse for ourselves sometimes because we get involved in technical debates when the actual debate is about something very different and we confuse arguments about technical issues with arguments about why we're having an argument, right? So don't bother with that. Um, don't go near issues of free speech, data access or secrecy. Right? Those things have a resonance that is far, far stronger than anything that you can possibly deal with. Um, do not imply that people should not talk. Do not imply that people should not have their opinions. Do not imply that people should be arrested for having opinions. All of these things are huge public discourse no-nos. Um, and, you know, yesterday there was a little bit, and there was, if you were following the Twitter feed, there was a little bit of back and forth on this. Complete waste of our time. Don't go there. Don't engage with people who are just looking for trouble. Right? Just ignore it. Right? There are far more people who are actually interested in what you have to say that you don't have to spend a lot of time talking to people who are never going to believe a word you say. Don't be excessively advocacy-ish. Advocacy. Advocacy? Um, you know, there's a difference between what the science shows and what you think we should do about it. I'm being intimidated here. <laughs> do no not... More free, no more free I know, I know. No more free speech. Again. I'm being oppressed! <laughs> um, you know, perceived attempts to shut down debate, just really... Exactly, you see? They're frequently counterproductive because you're scared of my ideas. You don't want to hear the truth, Alan. I mean, the, the classic example, which even involved Carl Sagan back in the day, was uh, Velikovsky's World in Collision, which you should read about uh, if you really want to know about how to uh, screw up a public discourse. Um, you know, and there's lots of examples in our things. Um, 
don't be arrogant. Don't be, don't be mean. Okay. Um, I would, uh, this will be my conclusion slide. Okay. So we don't do everything very perfectly, right? Right now, there are a lot of things that are going on that are wrong and, in, uh, and strategically not useful. We overgeneralize too much, right? And this is very general, right? People that use the term scientists say or models prove or deniers claim, none of those statements are, are generally true, right? Some scientists may have said something, a model may have shown something, a denier may have claimed something, right? But when you generalize it like that, you just, you're just setting up a red rag to a bull because there's obviously people who do not claim that, who do not say that, who did not prove that, right? So don't, don't overgeneralize, it's just pointless. We can be quite naive about what policymakers and the public want or need, right? And sometimes, and even in you know, quite high profile venues, we assume, oh, policymakers need this or they want that without actually ever having talked to a policymaker or somebody from the public. Uh, don't do that. Talk to, talk to them, ask them, listen, those are things. And we shouldn't complain about the costs of doing research, right? It's just like, People who ask you to communicate about your data or your paper or like to have your paper be available on open access or who criticize you or ask you questions, that is the price for doing research. If you don't want any of that, don't do research. Do not complain about this after the fact. And my one little bugbear, and I'll leave on this, is I am sick and tired of people telling me that I'm so stupid because I don't know that the deficit model is crap, okay? <laughs> there really is an information gap. Right? Most people do not know very much about most things. Right? Helping fill that gap is not stealth advocacy for a broader values or policy preferences. It really isn't. And the next time somebody tells me that it is, I'm going to get very, very mad and I may tweet at them. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, people that assume that everybody who's talking in public is advocating for the same thing, that's not true. Right? I, I was in a room recently and everyone said, well, you know, Surely we're all, walking, we're all working towards uh, implementing a cap-and-trade regime on an international scale. And I said, um, yeah, no, not really. <laughs> and they said, well, no, 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 really, that's what you mean, right? Well, no, not really. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know whether an international cap-and-trade scheme is the best thing in the world. I don't know whether a carbon tax would be a, a useful thing. I don't know that mandates uh, could be more effective, right? I am not a policy analyst. I am not an economist. I am not a futurologist. I'm a climatologist. I know about climate science. And when I talk, I generally want to talk about climate science, right? People are not all advocating for the same thing. And uh, now I've, I've been intimidated, so I must stop. <laughs>